Um, uh, so, you know, as, as deep learning practitioners, um, whenever I go and train a deep learning model for image classification, I always wonder, you know, how should I design my network? What pooling method should I use? Where should I add skip connections? And, and also, you know, it's very, like, it's natural to wonder whether a custom design architecture will perform better for my task than a pre-canned one like VGG, uh, Google Lynette, or ResNet. And these types of questions are kind of the, the questions that are being addressed by uh, this new method uh, from in machine learning called neural architecture search. And you've probably seen some headlines touting the AutoML and NAS capabilities of some of the big tech companies like Google and Microsoft. But actually, we probably already do some level of neural architecture search today as part of our hyperparameter tuning for deep learning. So if you look at hyper tuning for a standard deep learning network, here I'm showing a very simple deep learning uh, or deep network where the layers kind of just go sequentially from one to the next. And some and the hyperparameters that we might want to tune include both architectural and non non architectural parameters. So on the architectural side, we have hyperparameters like the number of nodes that we might want to use per layer, the number of total layers in the network, as well as the activation function that we want to apply after each of the transformations. And some common non architectural hyperparameters that we tune and practice include things like the regularization rate, the learning rate, and the batch size, which control uh, basically the generalization performance of your model as well as, uh, as the complexity uh, or and as well as the optimization trajectory. Um, so, you know, we all do some architectural tuning already, uh, but what really differentiates neural network architecture design is the granularity of the search bases that are being considered. So if we take a look at the Google Lynette architecture, for example, there are a lot more architectural decisions that need to be made, like the operations that we want to use and also how to chain together these operations to uh, form a larger network. So, so basically more granular search spaces are needed for NAS and these are the types of search spaces that we're going to be looking at today. And you might be wondering where does NAS fit in to the larger picture of AutoML and uh, with some of the previous talks that we've had, we've seen that hyperparameter optimization is a big component of AutoML. And the stated goal of, of neural network um, of NAS is to automate network design. But re in reality, as we saw before, it really just involves searching through a larger space of possible architectures. So our view is that NAS is a special case of hyperparameter optimization. So this is kind of where, auto, uh, where NAS fits. And why should you care about NAS for your problems? Uh, the main reason is that NAS is state-of-the-art today for many machine learning problems. And computer vision in particular has seen uh, a, lot of, a lot of research uh, attention from NAS. And here you can see that a NAS architecture called Monasnet is, uh, achieves better performance on ImageNet than many hand-designed architectures like ShuffleNet and, and MobileNet. And we see similar trends in other areas of ML like natural language processing where a recently NAS discovered transformer uh, was able to improve the performance um, on NLP tasks and also in graph learning where NAS has seen success designing graph neural networks. So, you know, really this is where you're going to be able to get the best performance um, from your data or achieve or be able to train the best models for your data. So what's the catch? Uh, the catch is really that the computational cost that's associated with NAS. So first generation NAS methods, they were able to achieve state-of-the-art performance on image classification and language modeling. So here I'm showing some NAS discovered architectures uh, for Safar 10 and um, Penn Tree Bank. Uh, and, but they were able to do so at tremendous compute computational costs. So in the case of Safar 10, it took over 3,000 GPU days in order to find this architecture. And in the case of Pendry Bank, it took over 10,000 CPU days. So this is a massive amount of compute that most uh, practitioners just do not have access to unless you work at Google or, or something like that. 
Uh, the good news is that more recently in research, in the research community, there's been a concerted uh, effort to reduce the computational cost associated with MAS. And weight sharing in particular has emerged as a promising method uh, for efficient neural architecture search. And the way that weight sharing works is that uh, you have a single weight sharing network that encompasses all the possible architectures in your search space so that you can use this single network work to perform the search instead of training all the architectures uh, from your search space individually as was done in the first generation methods. So with weight sharing, the search cost of NAS is reduced to that of training just a single network. And this costs on the order usually of less than 10 GPU days. So this is a drastic reduction in computational cost um, that we've been able to achieve recently uh, in the field. So it's also, you know, what's the trade-off? You would assume that the trade-off of kind of using weight sharing is that you sacrifice some um, accuracy in, in the, the architectures that you're able to discover. But with the additional uh, improvements um, in recent research, weight sharing methods have been able to match the performance of sort of the first generation methods that required on the thousands of GPU days um, to perform the architecture search. Uh, that said, there are still a lot of outstanding questions about weight sharing and also a lot of skepticism about whether this is the right approach for NAS. So in this talk, I'm going to present some of my work on sort of getting a better understanding of weight sharing through the lens of optimization. Um, and in the second part, I'll talk about how you can start applying NAS in practice with Determine's open source deep learning platform. So in this first part, uh, we'll kind of go over some key questions. So first, what do NAS search spaces look like in more detail? Uh, how does weight chain work? It certainly sounds like uh, a crazy thing to kind of train a model that incorporates all the architectures in your search space. And finally, how should we solve the optimization problem associated with these weight sharing methods? So let's go back to the Google Net architecture that we looked at previously. Uh, and in this example, just at, the, at a glance, you can see that there's a lot of repeating structure in the Google Linux architecture. And in fact, the larger architecture is built um, by stacking many of these repeating blocks together to form a larger architecture. And this sort of uh, approach is the exact approach that's taken by many NOS search spaces where the search base is concerned with what's called a cell block, and that cell block is then repeated multiple times to form the larger architecture. And the reason that we do this is because otherwise the search space is just too large and quickly becomes in intractable computationally. Um, so going back to sort of the NOS terminology, we have these cell block search spaces. And here I'm showing kind of a more detailed example of what a NOS search space looks like. So in this example, you have four different nodes, and these nodes correspond to intermediate feature representations within your network. And the edges, and then you have edges between nodes indicating the flow of data and transformations that are applied to the features as we pass the data from one node to the next. So if you look at the edge from one to two, there are two possible operations, a convolutional operation and a pooling operation. So the feature representation at two will be a combination of, or will be one of the operations applied to the representation at one. So that's kind of how you can interpret the search space. Now, individual architectures from the search space will activate certain edges and operations. So here you have an example architecture and associated with each architecture is an optimal set of weights that minimize your loss on uh, with this architecture. So, um, and then we definitely have a lot of architectures in the search space. And for standard first generation NOS methods or hyperparameter tuning uh, methods, the way that you'd search through the space is to basically use what I'll, I'll call full training, where we train individual architectures for every single, or individual models with distinct weights for each architecture uh, in order to find a a suitable one for your problem. So if we go back to what we just said, these kind of first generation NAS methods solve an objective function 
where uh, it, it, it's sort of solving a two-stage objective function where in the first part, they optimize weights for distinct architectures. So fix an architecture, optimize the weights for that architecture. Then in the outer loop, they try a bunch of different architectures and return the best. So it's a two-stage process to perform architecture search. As, and as I mentioned before, the weights are distinct because we have distinct architectures and distinct weights. Uh, and the goal is to optimize for the best architecture. And hence, the cost is very high with these first generation methods. So how about weight sharing? So what does the weight sharing super network look like? Um, the, as I said before, the weight sharing network includes all possible architectures. And the way that it does this is it basically includes all possible edges and all the operations on each edge as part of the super network. And it is then parameterized by a set of architecture parameters that I'll, I'll call alpha, which you can think of as gates on the operations on each edge. So uh, given a certain configuration of alpha, that corresponds to a specific um, standalone architecture. So we can, uh, we can configure the super network according to any possible architecture with this, within the search space by just setting alpha. And as you can imagine, minimizing and optimizing the super network with a fixed alpha uh, will give you basically the same result as optimizing the independent architecture. So under this shared uh, network approach, um, we've kind of changed the problem by moving the architecture parameters into the model. So now we have a single uh, level problem where we are simultaneously trying to optimize W and alpha. But this naive approach is still very expensive because we are still looking for the best architecture and this search space is combinatorially large in terms of all the possible um, architectures. But the good news is that we can massage this uh, new objective using certain techniques to make this objective more amenable to efficient search. And gradient weight sharing in particular is, um, is is an attractive approach for this problem. So let's see how we can kind of change the objective to something that is easier to tackle with standard techniques. So a, a fairly common trick that uh, we apply in practice to make you know, discrete problems easier to, is to use continuous relaxation. So what that means is instead of optimizing over a discrete space, we optimize over a continuous uh, space that kind of reflects the original problem, but is not exactly the same. And with this relaxation, now we're able to compute gradients with respect to the architecture parameters data. And now we can basically use our favorite uh, gradient descent algorithms like Adam, Adagrad, and so on in order to learn the right architectural parameters for our problem. Uh, and a common relaxation that's used for NOS is what I call a mixture relaxation of the architecture space. And uh, the relaxation is fairly simple, where instead of selecting a single operation on an edge, we actually will take a weighted combination of the operations on an edge. So here we'll have, uh, we'll weight the, we'll, we'll calculate the representation at node two as the weighted sum of both the pooling and convolutional operations applied to the, in, to the input representation. So under this shared uh, view where we've applied a relaxation to the original problem, the computational cost has, is now much lower because we can use gradients, but we've also kind of shifted the problem to learning the best mixture instead of learning the best architecture. Uh, so let's first talk about how we can now solve this relaxed objective. So uh, here I'm showing uh, the, an algorithm outline for a NOS algorithm called DARTS, which was introduced by Liu et al. in 2019. And uh, most gradient-based weight chain methods follow a similar structure to, uh, to the algorithm, algorithmic approach that they take. So the algorithm is kind of div divided into two steps. And the first step, we update the shared weights W while fixing the architecture parameters theta. And this here, we're just using a standard uh, gradient descent update. And then we alternate to optimizing the architecture weights theta 
where, and where, so in this step, we fix the network parameters W and then we update uh, the weights data using Atom in the case of darts. So this is what's happening. So behind the scenes in step one of gradient-based weight sharing methods, where we optimize this objective over the, both the mixture weights and the shared network weight, weights W. However, because we're using the mixture relaxation, uh, in, in order to derive a discrete architecture, a second rounding stage is required where we apply threshold operations to the architecture weights theta in order to discretize uh, the architecture, architecture parameters and arrive at a discrete architecture. So one insight that we had from this problem um, is that uh, basically these, if you think about what the mixture space looks like, um, each edge is now representable by a probabilistic simplex. So that is now the space that we're optimizing over. So discrete architectures are the corners of the simplex shown on the left. And we are allowing uh, this architecture parameters data to lie anywhere uh, basically on the surface of this, uh, of this tetrahedron shape, uh, polyhedron shape. So one insight that we had is that the best mixture is almost certainly not going to correspond to the best architecture because the space of mixture is just much larger than discrete architectures. And uh, because we have a separate rounding stage that we want to, uh, that we will, that we know will apply at the end, um, if the mixture is very far away from a discrete architecture, then we can have severe degradations in performance when we perform the rounding. So intuitively, sparse mixtures will basically have a better correspondence to the returned architecture uh, as a result of the rounding stage because you'll be closer to a discrete architecture. And this is, this is some intuition for why we think sparsity will aid uh, for aid in the performance of neural architecture search methods. So with this insight, um, we like a natural step from this insight is basically um, that you should use a different gradient method in order to optimize in the simplex geometry. So it's well known in optimization that the exponentiated gradient descent method converges faster uh, for the simplex uh, relative to standard um, like gradient descent methods. So that is the uh, underlying idea behind our new proposed algorithm called GAIA, which stands for Geometry Aware Exponentiated Algorithms. And GAIA is a very simple modification that you can make to many existing uh, NOS algorithms. And really the main difference is in how the archite architecture parameters are updated. So instead of applying any old optimizer to the architecture parameters theta, our algorithm will use an exponentiated gradient update um, on theta and then, and then normalize it to project back into the simplex. And with this simple change, we're able to observe much better performance empirically. So in our paper, we show that the exponential gradient update has provably faster convergence on non-convex ob objectives like those used in NOS. Um, and as I said before, this approach is applicable to a lot of different NOS methods. And as we'll show later, we do empirically observe uh, better performance from sparsity. So how does Gaia do on kind of the standard benchmarks that are studied in NOS? So the first search space that we looked at is what's called the DART search space uh, for image classification on SOFAR 10. Um, and here on the left, I, I show, I'm showing the results for kind of standard hyperparameter optimization methods called like random search and ASHA. And on the right are weight sharing approaches. And you can see that the weight sharing approaches seem to do slightly better than the hyperparameter optimization methods. And with the geometry aware approach that we use in Gaia, we are able to improve upon the state of the art um, for this search space. So next we looked at the dark space search space now on ImageNet. And previously ImageNet, um, we, we saw kind of the first generation NOS methods. Those methods were leading the pack on ImageNet for NOS. So AmoebaNet in particular was one of the top architectures um, since then, weight sharing, as we, as I said before, has reduced uh, or has improved the performance 
dramatically with much more tractable computational cost. And with our geometry aware approach, where we are able to further improve upon the state of the art uh, for this search based on ImageNet. And the really amazing thing here is that while the first generation NOS methods like AmoebaNet required over 3,000 GPU days, Gaia required just four GPU days in order to find uh, a similarly performant architecture. Uh, we also looked at this um, benchmark for NOS called NOS Bench 201. And this benchmark in particular is very surprising because on this benchmark, we see traditional hyperparameter optimizations outperform uh, weight sharing methods like DARTS and GDOS. And the performance of DARTS in particular is very poor on this, on this benchmark. Uh, and the really interesting thing to us is that Gaia with the exponentiated gradient update was able to basically fix the, uh, the behavior of DARTS and, and reach state of the on this benchmark as well. And we're in fact the only way sharing method that outperforms standard hyperparameter optimization methods on this benchmark. Uh, and if you look at the best uh, architecture in this entire search space, we are, we've mirrored the performance of that Oracle uh, architecture. So this is a really promising result for Gaia as well. And we attribute it, uh, and also uh, I'm not showing, I'm not going to show results here, uh, but there are two other data sets that are part of this benchmark and we see similar trends uh, hold for Gaia on those two separate data sets. And our, our intuition and hypothesis for why this is the case is that Gaia is again able to learn sparser architectures um, than, uh, than methods like darts, for example. So if you look at, um, in order to kind of validate our hypothesis, we looked at the entropy of the architecture operations averaged across all the edges for the two benchmarks that we studied. And in fact, we do see uh, lower entropy for the architecture parameters learned by Gaia, which uh, correspond to higher sparsity. Okay, so now that we've kind of hopefully under have a better understanding of weight sharing uh, for NOS, let's see how we can apply some of the tools um, available on Determine's open source platforms uh, to to so that you can apply NOS in practice to your own problems. So I won't have time to go into detail on all the features of Determine, but I do want to give a quick overview. So Determine focuses on the model development and training aspects of uh, developing deep learning solutions. So we, we play nicely with kind of solutions at both the data prep stage and also the model deployment phase, but our core product focuses on improving the experience for machine learning model developers by providing some really awesome tools to help with productivity and happiness. Uh, so we interface with most of the common deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, and we also uh, work with uh, different cloud providers as well as um, like we can provision resources using your local compute cluster as well. So uh, we do a lot of the cluster management as and scheduling aspects of uh, deep learning for you. And Determine kind of helps with every with many different stages of the deep learning uh, workflow. So um, in the model training stage, we have a support for both single node and multi node distributed training. Uh, we have state of the art hyperparameter search, and finally, um, I think a really cool tool that we offer is experiment tracking um, for both exploration and experimentation uh, for reproducible reproducible exploration and experimentation. So let's see how these tools can be applied to for aid in applying NOS in practice. So uh, first, um, in the model training phase, Determine can aid in NOS by basically offering uh, very easy to use distributed training. So if you look at the original code base shown here for PC darts, we see that there are kind of two implementations of train.py and trainsearch.py. So there are separate implementations um, for both of these files for ImageNet because uh, ImageNet requires distributed training. Um, and these implementations use PyTorch and the implementations for distributed training was different enough to warrant a separate uh, script for ImageNet. With Determine, however, uh, exploiting distributed training is really as easy as changing two lines in your experiment config file. You do not have to 
um, write any additional code whatsoever besides changing the, the config for your experiment by increasing the slots per trial. And for those that are familiar with PyTorch, um, if you wanted to do distributed training, they, their methods that are provided there, uh, like data parallel or distributed data parallel for multi-node multi training, but you still have to do a lot of the manual work behind the scenes uh, to set up the networking and stuff for your instances. So De Determine makes distributed training really easy by handling all those details for you. So another benefit of distributed training with Determine is that we're able to uh, support cheaper preemptible spot instances and spot instances on AWS and G Cloud. So outside of Determined, um, we ran, we trained this Gaia PC darts model after we found the architecture uh, from scratch using eight NVIDIA V100s for around $1,500. But with Determined, we're able to exploit D-train and preemptible instances to reduce that cost to $500. And with multi-node D-Train, we can use cheaper GPUs, but more, more of them, so 16 NVIDIA K80s in this instance, to reach the same performance for an even lower cost of $250. So distributed training uh, is really helpful for NOS. Um, and so another component of Determine, as, I, as we said before, is the state-of-the-art hyperparameter search. And Determine, in particular, implements a version of ASHA, which is a state-of-the-art method that we um, developed in academia for hyperparameter search using that uses very aggressive early stopping uh, to speed up the search for a good hyperparameter setting. So in the charts below, we compare Determine's implementation um, to kind of the two uh, leading HP search methods in research, Asha and Bob. Um, and these two methods are available on, uh, on some of the platforms that we have speakers presenting in this event. So, um, so that's, that's really cool. And we see that uh, determines production grade HP search uh, method adaptive is able to match and exceed the state of the art research results in hyperparameter search for NOS. And, uh, you know, adaptive search and experiment determine is really easy to use. Um, all you have to do is specify a few fairly straightforward fields in the experiment config. Um, I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, I think I'm running a little low on time but uh, you can go and try it yourself with the experiment code that we provide. Um, and the, the nice thing about using uh, adaptive hyperparameter search for NOS is that these general purpose hyperparameter optimization methods are principled and robust, and they're guaranteed to converge to the best solution if you throw enough compute power at the problem. So in this case, we were able to match the performance of darts using Determine's adaptive search with 5x the resources needed with no tuning uh, of the hyperparameter algorithm, hyperparameter optimization algorithm at all. And this is in contrast to way sharing NOS methods that are quite sensitive to internal hyperparameters of the super network, um, like the learning rate and for the different optimization um, parameters and also just the, the overall complexity of the super network. So if we go back to the NOS Bench 201 results, we saw that darts failed catastrophically on this data set. And this is basically evidence that uh, way sharing is, uh, is fairly difficult to apply to new problems and new search spaces, which is why we recommend using kind of standard hyperparameter optimization methods as a first pass for NOS. That said, um, it's certainly the case that you know, more recent weight sharing methods have been able to improve the performance even more and widen the gap between uh, state-of-the-art NOS methods and standard HP search. So you, you can also try out our um, weight sharing, supported weight sharing uh, algorithms in Determine as well. So the final consideration for NOS in practice is reproducibility. And we've seen that reproducibility is very challenging for NOS. So here I'm showing the performance of various NOS algorithms on a RNN search base for the Penn Tree Bank data set. And in particular, we can see that the ENOS method um, has kind of widely varying performance across two different papers. So the reproduced result for ENOS is much worse and has much higher perplexity 
for this benchmark. And it is perhaps not surprising that uh, reproducibility is difficult for, um, for NOS because as we, as we said before, there's a lot of tuning involved of the weight sharing networks. They're also sensitive to random seeds because initialization of the supernet uh, can impact performance. And this is in addition to the other compute environment factors that you have to track, like the GPU type, the CUDA version, deep learning framework, Python version, et cetera. So um, yeah, so reproducibility is a challenge, but with Determine, we're able to provide reproducibility with the click of a button by automatically tracking uh, many of the artifacts that are required for re reproducibility throughout the course of an experiment. So we offer containerized training um, in order to have a reproducible environment for you when you need to revisit an experiment. We also have experiment tracking so that you don't lose track of the exact code that you executed. And after you've trained your model, we have a checkpoint uh, and model registry capability, which allows you to store that model and use it easily in downstream applications. So in conclusion, this talk, um, we, we looked at weight sharing and saw how it makes NOS computationally feasible for a wider audience without requiring thousands of GPU days. Uh, I also introduced Gaia, which is a geometry aware approach for NOS that finds better architectures faster by optimizing in the right problem geometry. And we were able to reach state of the art uh, results on ImageNet for NOS um, using, using our new approach. And finally, um, we looked at Determine's deep learning platform and saw how some of the components um, within Determine made it easy to apply NOS in practice. Uh, you can go and try state-of-the-art hyperparameter search for NOS and also Gaia weight sharing for NOS on Determine using the provided code that accompanied this talk. So lastly, um, I'd like to thank a lot of my collaborators, um, especially my advisor, PhD advisor previously uh, at CMU, Amit, um, who's also uh, the chief scientist at Determine, as well as many of my other collaborators that I've had throughout the years. Um, on some of the work that are presented here, like Asha and Gaia. And I hope you'll take Determine for a test run um, for to try to apply NOS to your problems uh, soon. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Liam. That, that was fantastic. Uh, we have some questions coming up. So uh, in the QA tab, uh, if you can see that, or I, I can read them off to you if you like. Uh, yeah, I can see that. So, um, so we have Brad asking, what are some good beginner resources for learning more about NOS methods? Um, I would say that uh, a survey by Elskin um, on Euro Architecture Search is a good place to start. Um, I think you'll quickly realize that these uh, NOS methods aren't, especially the weight sharing NOS methods, aren't too different from the models that you train uh, every day in practice because you're basically just taking derivatives. So there's like this line of NOS methods that have been uh, reaching state-of-the-art performance um, that I think will be very easy to approach for people that have uh, just been training neural nets for a while. Uh, so the second question is, what number of hidden layers are we looking into in NOS as compared to typical CNN? And how the performance of the selected model on validation set gets the feedback to the generated architecture. Um, so I'm not exactly sure uh, the second part of the question, but I can at least answer the first part. So, um, so for NOS, usually uh, things like you know the number of hidden layers and the learning rate and stuff, we fix that and focus explicitly on just the architectural decisions of like which operations and how to connect the different layers. Uh, and then there's like a separate stage where kind of more um, traditional hyperparameters are tuned after an architecture has been found. Um, yeah, so the second question, I think there's, there's a lot to dig in in order to answer it. And I don't know if it's, it's, uh, it'll be meaningful to dig into to the details here. So I'm gonna look at this, the next question. So is Gaia just taking the exponent of the gradient or is there more to it? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so Gaia, it, it is really that simple. Um, we use exponentiated gradient update. So instead of doing uh, the existing parameters minus a learning rate times the gradient, do the existing times the exponent of the negative 
uh, gradient and then normalize. So it's a really simple modification, uh, but there's a lot of theory supporting the use of exponential gradient in this case. And I would say the main contribution that we have is that we're able to provide convergence guarantees for a lot of the gradient-based weight sharing methods that have been introduced recently. Um, so that's, the, I, that's, I would say, the main contribution of our recent Gaia work. Um, okay, so can you talk about the connection between NOS and transfer learning? Do you still need NOS if you are doing transfer learning? Um, so I think there's some connection between NOS and transfer learning, and the connection there that I've seen is, the most direct, direct connection is uh, basically applying transfer learning to NOS. So uh, when you have a new data set or a new problem, you don't want to redo NOS from scratch. You want to transfer with some existing knowledge that you've uh, learned about which architectures work well for a related problem to a new data set. So there's some work on transfer learning there of like reducing the search costs when you have related problems. Um, so you can do transfer learning for NOS. Um, and in some sense, a lot of you are probably doing transfer learning already because you have Google and Facebook releasing the architectures that they found like Efficient Net or Mobile Net V3 and you're applying it to your own data. So that is also transfer learning because you're taking a NOS found architecture and applying it to your data, doing some fine tuning and so on. So I think there's also an exciting line of work where you can basically uh, do do a one shot NOS and then um, and then like find architectures for different deployment scenarios. That's also very interesting. Uh, okay, so Tomer has another question. Can you explain why Asha gets better results than Bob? Um, so yeah, so I will. So just a little background. So Asha is uh, an asynchronous version of successive having, which is used in hyperband and. Bob is Bayesian optimization wrapped around hyperband. The, the main difference here is that Asha uses a, an asynchronous promotion schedule and for large scale parallel experiments that uh, actually does much better than the synchronous um, success of having algorithm which is used by Bob. Um, and you know we've also observed that the adaptive portion uh, with via Bayesian optimization that's used in Bob didn't really make a difference in our experiments, but I would say that the uh, performance of Bayesian optimization kind of varies search space to search space and whether it helps or not. All right, let me check real quick on Slack. Uh, no questions there. Any other questions? And by the way, I should mention, um, we'll be having uh, the panel discussion at uh, uh, 420 PM Pacific this afternoon. Uh, so toward the end of the day, uh, Liam will be joining us on that. 